Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. So when Mike uh, invited me to come talk today, I really jumped at the chance because I know NAU is just a top-notch school, one of the top uh, forestry schools in the country, and you guys are going to be the forest managers and wildlife biologists um, in America, basically, in the future. So, um, and of course, if you're going to be dealing with forests in any western state, you're going to be dealing with the issue of forest fire. And you're probably also, um, if you're a forest manager, possibly going to be dealing with the issue of spotted owls. So this is an issue near and dear to my heart, and I really feel very honored to have been asked to come and speak today. So thank you very much. I started working on spotted owls way back in 1999. Um, I worked with Rocky Gutierrez. Some of you might be familiar with him. He's one of the leading experts on spotted owls. And the study site that I was working on was in the central Sierra Nevada, the El Dorado and Tahoe National Forests. But um, this research program that Rocky was running actually had five study populations at the time, three in California, and then one in Arizona, one in New Mexico. And when I joined, it had already been going for more than 10 years. And it was a demography study. So we were capturing owls and banding them and reciting bands and monitoring their survival and reproduction and doing a lot of habitat relationships work. Um, so it was really excellent. It was one of the you know, biggest uh, demography studies that had been done on spotted owls. So it was a privilege to work there and work on this issue. Um, when I started not soon after, Rocky came to me and said, you know, this issue of fire. A lot of people are saying that fire is something that's harming spotted owls. But we don't really know much about it. There isn't really much out there. And over the 10 years from their five different study populations, they'd accumulated some data from some burns that came through. And he said, you know, it kind of seems that the owls, contrary to what we thought, maybe they seem to be sticking around after the fire. And can you kind of comb through all this past data and see what's going on there and see if we can get a story about what's happening with the spotted owls um, in these burn sites compared to the unburned sites. And because we had banded owls, we knew whether they survived the fire, whether they were still in the same site that they were before, whether they were with the same mates, um, and then, of course, whether they were reproductive. So um, I collated the data, and what we found from that was short-term survival, site fidelity, mate fidelity, and reproduction were no different between the burned and the unburned sites. And this was the case even in owl sites that had quite a bit of high severity fire in it. And so back in um, 2002, when we first published this data, this was actually quite revolutionary. And when I was doing my literature review for writing the publication, I couldn't really find anything about spotted owls and fire. There was very little out there. It was just a couple of anecdotal conference proceedings and maybe like an article in a, a magazine or something like that. There was nothing really robust published about it. And we had, um, we had 11 t uh, territories and 21 owls that we were looking at. But it was only short term, so it was immediately after the fire. So there are still a lot more questions raised um, about this. OK, so now um, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about what, what. So after I'd done this study and published it, it really got me so excited that I knew that this is something that I want to continue doing. So I basically, this sort of launched my path into studying this issue of spotted owls and fires for the next 15 years of my life. So today I want to talk about the results of some of the additional research that I've done since that time, and then also some research that other folks have done on spotted owls and fire, some of the different subspecies. Um, but this issue of spotted owls and fire is really just a very small part of a much bigger reality. And this reality is that, that I'm going to talk to you today about is that forest fire, and we're not talking just the low severity fire, but especially high severity fire is an ecological necessity in Western forests, and it's natural. And that's, what this, that's why I'm calling this a new paradigm, because it's something that I'm going to hope over time we can embrace, that high severity fire, it, some, it creates communities of species that are different from areas of low severity or other parts of the forest that are unburned. And it's unique, and it's natural. And I'm talking about the biggest fires. These fires that look like this, that, uh, that's 100% mortality of all the vegetation and the trees over huge swaths of land, including you know, tens, even hundreds of hectares. And it creates a forest that looks like this, one with basically no living trees for a long way around. And you look at this and you say, how can a forest-dependent species live in this? Well, it turns out that 
you have species like the spotted owl, which I think are a little more tolerant and resilient to severe fire than, um, than we once thought. Um, but they're sort of more tolerant of it. You have species out there that are found nowhere else are they more abundant than in the severely burned forest. So it's really strong evidence that they require this kind of fire to, to create the conditions that are optimal for their survival. Um, a, an example of some of these species here. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those studies that look at these species as well to kind of tell the story of the naturalness of fire. And, what, and because they've evolved to be nowhere more abundant than in severe forest areas, this is telling us that these kind of fires have burned in western forests really for millennia, for thousands and thousands of years. And actually some new forestry research is, is also um, being published right now that kind of shows that high severity fire has been a part of western forest for millennia. Maybe there's some exceptions of lower elevation pure ponderosa pine forest, but the higher elevation, um, even ponderosa pine, ponderosa pine forest with some mixed conifer in there, they've always had high severity fire, maybe more than we had previously thought. So if we know this, I'll talk about some of these studies, but to suffice it to say that we know that high severity fire creates some really good habitat for a lot of species. And, and this has been published, and it's been known now for many years. So we know this, yet we still seem to vilify severe fire. In the media, often the Forest Service continues to vilify severe fire and call it unnatural. I read Forest Service documents where they're planning documents for logging projects where they say high severity fire has destroyed the forest. And Forest Service spokespeople after fires say that it's a moonscape and it's nuked. But even the most cursory read of the wildlife and fire literature shows this is not really always the case. So why is it that this attitude seems to persist that's really anti-fire? And then this sort of anti-fire rhetoric feeds a media frenzy against fire whenever large mega fires occur. Um, I would posit, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that I think economics is a big part of it, that the firefighting and, um, and conducting fire-related logging, like post-fire salvage logging and thinning, is a really big part of the Forest Service's budget. So there's an incentive to keep on logging in the name of fire. And then also, human psychology. A lot of times, um, people who are educated are often really reluctant to change their minds about something, a deeply held belief, even when they're presented with scientific data to the contrary. And so I think this is a really fascinating thing. And I think this has been a challenge in changing the dominant paradigm about um, high severity fire right now. OK, so I'm going to go back to spotted owls now and talk about the research that I've conducted and that other people have conducted to really weave a story that I think is going to be different from what's out there. Um, spotted owl, this is, there's three different subspecies. This is the northern spotted owl, then we have the California spotted owl, and the Mexican spotted owl. Um, it's a strongly associated with older forests, conifer and mixed hardwood forests throughout its range. It's also declining throughout its range. In, uh, the, the Mexican spotted owl and the northern spotted owl are listed as threatened species, and the California spotted owl is currently under consideration for listing as an endangered or threatened species. Um, and they primarily eat small mammals. Um, things like wood rats and gophers and flying squirrels and mice and um, that kind of thing. And so part, ba ba right now what you hear a lot of is that fire is the biggest threat to spotted owls. Um, but data I'm going to show you is not really suggesting and supporting this. OK, so back to when I first started this work. Spotted owls have higher survival and better reproductive success in territories with more high canopy cover and large trees. This was pretty well established. And because of this, spotted owls throughout their range are management indicator species for older forests. High severity fires are presumed to pose the greatest risk to owl habitat, leading to timber harvest to lower fire risk and post-fire salvage logging. But spotted owls evolved in a landscape where severe fire was an important component. And most studies of habitat selection were conducted in areas that had not experienced recent fire but had been logged, so the primary disturbance was logging and not fire. So this is what we knew about foraging habitat, roosting habitat, nesting habitat. Now, back when I was still working for Rocky Gutierrez in the central Sierra Nevada, in 2001, a really big fire burned in the northern part of our study area. It was called the Red Star Fire. And several of our territories burned up there. And because I just published this data in um, looking at spotted owls and fire throughout the range, 
I was interested in reading some of the planning documents because the Forest Service proposed salvage logging in this site. And when I was reading their documentation, they were saying that the burned forest was not suitable habitat for spotted owls, none of it, including the low severity burn, none of it. Once it burned, it's not going to be habitat for spotted owls. So they needed to clear cut it all and replant it. And it's because that, ha that was not habitat for owls, it wasn't going to adversely affect them. And not only that, but th that would be the best thing to help the owls, would be to clear cut it and replant. We've got to grow that green forest back as quickly as possible. Um, and then sort of the next year and the year after that and the year after that, I was continuing to read these, these planning documents, environmental impact statements that were put out by the Forest Service about their, sal their salvage logging projects in different fires, and they were saying the same thing, that burn forest is not habitat, so it wouldn't affect them if they cut it down and replant. And I started thinking, how do we know that? We don't know what spotted owls use. We know what kinds of habitats they use in unburned areas that, you know, not necessarily unburned, but hadn't burned in a long time, hadn't experienced recent fire. What if the owls were taking advantage of the burn forest in some way? But on the contrary, what if they were avoiding the burn forest and just using the green forest within the matrix of the, the burn area? We just had no idea. And year after year went by, and nobody was doing the research, so I said, okay, I gotta answer this question. So colleagues and I, oops, Colleagues and I, um, from the Institute for Bird Populations, we um, radio tagged seven owls in the McNally Fire in the southern Sierra Nevadas, is in the Sequoia National Forest. And at the time, it was one of the biggest fires in Sierra Nevada history, a very big fire. Um, and we radio tagged our owls and tracked them around. And we were interested in determining where they preferred to forage when they were given a choice of unburned, low burn, moderate burn, high severity patches and also where they preferred to roost and nest. Although with nesting, we didn't have that much information because we didn't have that many owls. But basically, roosting and foraging. Where, where did they prefer to roost and forage in this kind of area? And what we found was that the probability of California spotted owl foraging was highest in the severely burned and lowest in the unburned forest. So here you've got, this is distance from center of foraging range because owls are central place foragers. They, they go back to a, a nest or central roost area. So you have to account for distance when you're looking at probability of use. And so this is, this is for foraging. This is relative probability of use. This is unburned forest. This is severely burned. So you can see that closer to the nest or, or core roost area, they had the highest probability of use in any kind of um, forest stand. But with these three burn severities, they were selecting the burned areas for foraging. And this surprised even me. I couldn't believe how much they were using these severely burned forests for foraging. But then when we thought about it, it made some sense because perhaps these severely burned forest areas increased accessibility, maybe increased the abundance of the prey that they like to eat. Um, and it had, you know, it was patchy. So you had these sort of under, unburned and lightly burned areas where they could still nest and roost. I forgot to mention that they still preferred to roost in areas that hadn't burned or that were low burned. So they, their roosting habitat was the same as in um, other previous studies, but the foraging was really different. And we went ahead and um, collected pellets, regurgitated pellets from the owl, which contains little um, bones and things from their prey that they eat, and we analyzed what they were eating. And this is me at the California Academy of Sciences using their, their um, reference collection. Um, we found that they were mostly eating gophers, pocket gophers. Um, and then the next, so more than 40% of the prey by biomass was pocket gophers, and then about 25% was flying squirrels, and then about 15% was wood rats. And pocket gophers are found in more open areas, not in deep, you know, high canopy forests, but more open areas. They eat grasses and forbs, uh, willow, ceanothus shrubs, and these, we did measurements, and these plants were all very prevalent in the severely burned forests. So they were eating a lot of gophers in these high severity burn patches. And then as part of another study that we did, we also looked at home range sizes. And so um, the home range size of the owls in our McNally fire were the same size as from owls in unburned study areas. I collaborated with some folks in other areas, unburned study areas, and used their data from the same time period. And we found that home range sizes were no different in our McNally fire compared with the unburned. And um, what this tells us is that they didn't have to range farther to find their prey. In, uh, in burned areas compared with unburned. Okay, so those were the owls in the McNally fire. And in the, these were owls that were occupying sites that were continuously 
uh, I'm sorry, these are owls that were in sites that were continuously occupied since the fire. So we selected our owls based on the fact that they had been there. Some, we don't know if it's the same owls, but owls had occupied those sites since the McNally fire. This got us thinking about the larger picture. What were occup occupancy dynamics like between unburned and burned sites? Um, are there some sites that are not occupied after fire because it burned too much, for example? So we investigated this question. Um, we looked at, we, we gathered, we, we collected from the Forest Service their spotted owl survey data forms, or original field data forms, from all surveys that had been conducted in all owl sites in these six different fires. All, these are all the big fires that occurred from 2000 to 2007 within the Sierra Nevada. So we asked the Forest Service to give us data on all the owls in these different fires, and then also surrounding areas, so we could have unburned control. And we got data from 2000, 2007. We also asked for five years before that. So for the burned owl sites, we had five years previous to the fire and then after the, in several years after the fire, we also had unburned and then burned. So we had a nice before after control impact type study. And we were modeling occupancy with, with these data where you're um, estimating detectability and getting a, a modeled estimate of occupancy. And what we found was there was no difference in occupancy dynamics between burned and unburned breeding sites in the Sierra Nevada. No difference in extinction and colonization rates and then overall occupancy. And then so here's a um, graph of what we found. This is year 1998 to 2007. And this is proportion occupied. And this is unburned. And this is the burned. So they were the same. And one of the things I'd wanted to do with this is look at um, how the proportion of high severity fire around the owls um, how that was a covariate for how that might have affected occupancy, but I didn't have enough data to do it. And neither did I have enough data about salvage logging because I wanted to look at that effect as a covariate to occupancy, but we didn't have enough data. We ran the models, but we weren't able to estimate our standard errors, and so it kind of didn't work. Um, but I'll talk about that later because we were able to do it in, the, in another study area. But we did have some information on post-fire salvage logging in which we knew that eight of the sites had been post-fire salvage logged. And of those, seven sites were occupied after the fire, but after post-fire salvage logging, none of them were occupied. Um, so that was an important finding, even though we weren't, it wasn't part of our statistical analysis. I gave some indication that maybe post-fire salvage logging could be a problem for the owls. Um, and then another finding was that the colonization rates, the likelihood of a, uh, the probability of a site being reoccupied after the fire was 38%. So even if a site wasn't occupied after fire, it stood a good chance of being occupied again at some point in the future. So, but when you salvage log, you're kind of decreasing that probability of the owls being able to use it. Um, so that's what we found there. Okay, so then we turned our sites to Southern California. Um, I collaborated with the Forest Service there on a lot of, they had a lot of really great survey data. Um, there was the, one of the Rocky study sites um, on, of the demography study was there and they surveyed all the way up to I think 2001 and then they, they stopped surveying there. But then in 2001, I was living down there, um, there was a big bark beetle epidemic, killing a bunch of trees. And um, so the Forest Service got a lot of money to do monitoring, and then they started monitoring again in 2003. And then 2003 to 2011, there was a period of elevated fire activity. There was a lot of fires there. And they had, um, I gathered data on the same kind of data, the survey data of the spotted owl surveys um, beginning in 2003 to 2011. And, um, and doing the same kind of occupancy modeling. But this time, we had, so we had 146 sites, 71 of them burned. So that was pretty good data, and we had really great um, yearly surveys that were done there. And this time, we had enough information to be able to look at how the proportion of high severity burn was affecting occupancy of the owls. Oh, and I wanted to mention really quickly that, I'm gonna turn back again so you can read it. Um, to quickly mention that Southern California is a lot hotter, a lot drier, and has these really extreme fire weather. You have Santa Ana winds. So that's one of the reasons why the fires are so much more prevalent than in the Sierra Nevada. So we found that in Southern California, again, like in Sierra Nevada, site occupancy was equivalent in unburned and burned sites. So we didn't find any difference in occupancy dynamics, any significant difference. But we found some evidence that occupancy might have been reduced when a majority of the forested area um, around the spotted owl nester roost burned at high severity. Okay, so what that means is um, when we, we just looked at the beta estimates and they were all, uh, the, high, the amount of high severity fire occurred in all the top models, um, but 
the confidence interval overlapped zero every time. So we couldn't be certain that this, you know, it, there, we thought there might be some biologically meaningful effect there, but we couldn't be certain because it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but when we looked at, when we broke it out by the proportion of high severity fire, we found that in a 200 hectare circle around each spotted owl site, the nest and roost, there was about 100 hectares of forested habitat. When about 50 hectares of that burned at high severity, 50 or more, that's when we started to see hints of adverse impacts on occupancy. So it was only when a large amount of high severity fire occurred around an owl area that we started to see lower occupancy rates. And so we, we were seeing an adverse effect, but it was a very small effect. Um, <clears throat> but we think there's something meaningful there, that yes, more high severity fire means reduced occupancy. So it got us wondering what this meant for this population of owls in this extremely fire prone region um, of Southern California. And uh, earlier research had shown that spotted owls tend to reoccupy sites where reproductive, reproduction was previously successful. So they like to kind of occupy sites where they know they've, they've replaced themselves before. And so um, we then looked at, we did multi-state occupancy modeling where we looked at occupancy and reproduction. And we were able to account, so we looked at occupancy and reproduction, how this was affected by severe fire, but also the reproductive history at a site, what the state was previously, and how that might fit into this whole question. And what we found was that in Southern California, severe fire reduced occupancy only in sites where owls were not reproductive or even really vacant the previous year. So this meant that there are sites that we're thinking that might be higher quality sites that were consistently occupied and reproductive, and it didn't matter how much high severity fire occurred in there. The owls would stay and they would reproduce there. So it was only in the more marginal sites where when you had more high severity fire, they would abandon it. And so um, that I thought was very interesting because this kind of fits into what's going on with the population down there. How much is fire having an adverse effect? Maybe not as much as we think because it's not affecting occupancy and reproduction in those higher quality territories. Okay, so in 2013, the Rim Fire burned in um, parts of Yosemite and the Stanislaus National Fire Forest nearby there. This is the biggest fire in recorded history in the Sierra Nevada. It burned through 46 spotted owl territories, um, known spotted owl sites. And then the year after the fire, the Forest Service conducted protocol surveys. So in 2014, they did surveys throughout all of these sites. And um, they gave us the data, the original data forms. We did occupancy modeling here as well. <clears throat> this paper is going to be coming out in the Condor in a month. Um, we found site occupancy by California spotted owls one year after the Rim Fire was exceptionally high, even higher than rates from unburned areas. And in our previous study, um, Lee et al. 2012, so we had really high occupancy rates in the, the Rim Fire. Um, maybe the habitat was really great even before the fire. For whatever reason, there were a lot of owls that continued to occupy the Rim Fire one year later. Again, this is short term, one year later. But then, um, so spotted owl management in um, California, I think also here in, for the Mexican spotted owls, you, the, the Forest Service creates these PACs, which are protected activity centers. And it's the older forest habitat in a certain area around, you know, boundary around the nests and roosts. In Cal the California spotted owl, we do 300 acres. Here, I think you do 600 acres. Um, but we have 300 acre PACs. So the Forest Service uh, quantified how much high severity fire occurred within the 300 acre PACs around the nests and roosts of these sites, um, of these spotted owl areas. And so we could use that as a covariate for occupancy. And what we found, this is percent of the pack burned at high severity, zero to 100. This is occupancy probability. This is probability of any occupancy. This is probability of occupancy by pairs. So first of all, you can see how high our modeled occupancy was uh, at these sites. It was really quite high. Um, that we, what we found again is that any occupancy the more the, the pack burn at high severity, the lower the occupancy. But this did not hold true for pair occupancy. So this kind of seems to lend similar um, support to that idea that we found in Southern California, which is really maybe it's just the marginal sites, the ones that are occupied by singles that, have, um, that are adversely affected by high severity fire, and that you have some high quality sites that are consistently occupied by pairs. And we couldn't do reproduction because we didn't have enough data for it, but, um, but this is what we found with just regular plain occupancy. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about other studies that were done on, um, on different subspecies of spotted owls when looking at the fire issue. Susan Roberts worked in Yosemite National Park 
And she had um, randomly selected survey areas, both in burned and unburned sites, and found that occupancy and reproduction is not different between the burned and unburned California spotted owl sites in this unmanaged landscape. Published that in 2011, Biological Conservation. We have the illustrious Jeff Jeanette who published his work in 2004, and Paul Byers is part of that too. Um, there wasn't any significant correlation, significant correlation between recent fire and occupancy of Mexican spotted owl sites throughout the Southwest. Uh, and then there's this cool study just published by Joe Ganey, who's not here now, but um, does some really great work, where they had um, radio tagged Mexican spotted owls. Four of them moved from an unburned area in the winter, moved to burned wintering sites. And they trapped for small mammals at the original um, breeding season nesting area and the uh, corresponding burned winter site and found greater biomass and abundance of small mammal prey at the burned sites. And so I think the idea here is that spotted owls are probably depleting the prey around their um, nesting area during the breeding season. And so they need to move out and find new areas during the winter. And this actually is corroborated. Uh, Andrew Carey did work in the 90s similar to this, where they found that um, spotted owls depleted their prey during the breeding season. And that might be one of the reasons why they, um, some of them migrate during the non-breeding season outside, uh, away from their breeding areas, and then they go back the following year. And Darren Clark and his colleagues up in um, southwestern Oregon found that post-fire logging, which so they had the wildfire, but then they had a lot of post-fire logging that happened there. And it lowered the occupancy of northern spotted owl sites in southwestern Oregon, and it also lowered daily survival. Um, and they published this in Journal of Wildlife Management, and then there's another study in the Journal of Raptor Research. Okay, so I'm going to kind of pull this all together into a story um, about spotted owls, I was saying, that might be a little different from what, what you might be hearing out there. First of all, spotted owls generally survive and continue, continue to reproduce in territories that experience severe fire. But only marginal sites, often vacant and non-reproductive, have lower occupancy after severe fire. Spotted owls nest and roost in stands with high canopy cover, even in burned landscapes. So that's still important to them. You can't have a giant area of all high severity burn. They still need to have their roosting habitat and nesting habitat. They have to have some of that around. So a nice mosaic of that is optimal. Oops. But they forage in severely burned stands. So I like to say that the, the severely burned stands can be the kitchen. And the unburned and lightly burned stands around that can be the bedroom and the nursery, and also a little bit the kitchen, too, because they're foraging in all of these different areas. Home range sizes are similar between burned and unburned landscapes. And finally, post-fire logging causes territory abandonment and reduces survival. And I think you guys don't have so much post-fire salvage logging down here. I was talking with Mike, and it doesn't seem to be prevalent, but it's very, very prevalent in the Sierra Nevada. After almost every fire, the Forest Service proposes sal post-fire salvage logging. <clears throat> regardless of whether the site is occupied or not by spotted owls. They go and they do these surveys, but it doesn't really matter because they'll still salvage log the severely burned stands. Okay, so I would characterize spotted owls not as something that needs severe fire. It's something that is, just tolerates it and maybe can take, an advan take advantage of severely burned stands when it occurs under certain circumstances, under certain configurations. Um, but there are species out there that are far more abundant in severely burned stands than anywhere else. And that, I think, is an, a, another important part of the story. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the key studies that have been done on um, other avian species and other taxa in severely burned forests to help us understand the importance and the naturalness of this disturbance. So the guy you want to go to if you want to know about land birds and fire is Dick Hutto from the University of Montana. He has been doing research for the last 30 years, and he's amassed the largest database of its kind in the world. Um, he started out, this is a publication from um, Conservation Biology in 1995. He had 2,000 point count surveys in 50 different fires, and he found 100 different bird species in those burns, recent burns. He, he surveyed a lot of other kinds of habitats as well, but he found 100 species in the recent burns. Half of those were nesting in there, and 15% were far more abundant in the recent burns than anywhere else. And so what, what he stated there is that severely burned forest creates a unique composition of bird species. So they are, these birds can be found in other kinds of habitats, but at lower numbers. It's only in the severely burned patches that they reach their greatest numbers. 
and he's been published since then. He's visited over 120 different buyers and have, has conducted 7,000 point count surveys in these buyers. And he's been continuing to publish. So he's a good name if you want to go look into this research. Um, he's really done some great stuff. And part of, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the concepts that came out of his research. First is that fire-dependent species are abundant not only early on after fire, but different species become relatively more abundant different times after fire. So it's not just you know, right after fire. You want to look, if, you're, if you go in and survey a, forest, a, a fire area here, like right after a fire happens, you're going to find some stuff and it'll be interesting. But some species only become more abundant in the post-fire forest several years. For example, you have black bag woodpeckers that love the recently burned forest. I'm going to talk about them in a little bit. But five to ten years later, you start to see much more abundant northern flickers because these birds like to have the trees that are a little bit more decayed. So you look at the life history of species and you can see different times since fire, more of them will become abundant. But for me, the larger point here is that at any point after a fire, the forest is useful to species uh, in all these different successional stages from, you know, nothing but black trees, 100% mortality year after the fire to th two or 300 years after the fire when it's old growth. Also, different species are relatively more abundant in different burn severities. So some post-fire forests are mostly green, mostly brown, some are mostly black. And it's important to account for fire severity when you're looking at faunal responses to fire. And here's an example, a good example here, Christina Smucker and her colleagues in the Bitter Bitterroot Valley of Montana. They had before and after fire. Um, so they kind of took, took a advantage of an opportunistic fire that occurred. When they looked simply before and after, and they had 40 different species here, they found four bird species increased in relative abundance after fire and five decreased. But when they then placed each point count into its corresponding low, moderate, high severity fire or unburned, they then found um, additional significant responses for 10 more species. They found that 12 species increased in relative abundance after one or more fire severities, when you break it down like that, and seven decreased. And this is a lot different scenario than the four up, five down that we saw when you just say fire in general, but you don't break it up by fire severities. And overall, they found twice as many bird species increased as decreased in response to severe fire. Okay, so this one I'm going to talk about. Um, Cot Natasha Cotlier did work in the Cerro Grande fire in New Mexico. I think that burned in, uh, I don't remember when, but they published it in 2007. And so this is in your neck of the woods here. Um, in mixed conifer forest habitat. Uh, and they did the same kind of thing as Smucker. They had pre-fire transects, and they had been doing point counts, and then a fire burned. So they took an, uh, this opportunity to then do post-fire surveys. And they found that 70, when they just looked after the fire, this is just after the fire, 71% of bird species exhibited either positive or neutral density responses to fire effects across the fire severity gradient. But then when they included data from before the fire, they had information on four, oops, four different species. Um, only four of them responded significantly to the fire, and all four species increased significantly in the severe burn. And they stated in their paper, assumptions about overriding negative ecological effects of recent crown fires in southwestern Ponderosa pine forest are invalid for avifauna at Sierra Grande. So even here, you have a unique bird community that occurs after high severity fire. Okay, you're probably getting sick of this, but I keep showing this. Of all the, These are the different bird species that increase are far more abundant in severely burned forests than in unburned forests. And so this, what this is really telling us is that this is natural. You wouldn't have this unique bird community if uh, this what hadn't been happening for you know, thousands of years. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the blackback woodpecker. You guys don't have this down here, but I worked on a telemetry study of blackback woodpeckers. I wrote a conservation strategy for the Forest Service. This is a species that's very important to me as well as the, as the spotted owl. Um, I call it the king of the burned forest species. So if any of you guys are going to be working somewhere within the range of this bird, this is going to be an important one to know for management. Um, it's found in the boreal forests of Canada, down in uh, Oregon, Washington, through the Sierra Nevada, it's in the um, northern Rockies, a little bit down in the southern Rockies, but mostly in the northern Rockies and then also parts of New England. And so it's a really a northern kind of boreal bird. But it loves the high severity fire. It is, it's really, really hard to find this bird in areas that are not severely burned, recent severely burned. So they do occur in unburned areas. Um, they're found sometimes in bark beetle areas. But recent research done in South Dakota looked at unburned 
uh, bark beetle killed areas and then severely burned and found that severely burned, they had much higher reproductive success, much higher nest density, and much greater population density. So that's really the habitat that they love. And Dick Hutto says that that's why their backs are black, because they can then be camouflaged against the black of the trees. They've evolved to be that way. And so I worked in the Southern Cascades, Lassen National Forest, doing a telemetry study looking at their foraging habitat. Um, this is one of our nest sites. You can see there's the nest right there. And you could, it's not a, not a green tree in sight. This is what they love. This is where they do best. So why do they like this really severely burned forest? And so this, this is the black-backed woodpecker, but it's also a lot of other woodpeckers and other bird species as well. Um, they like to eat the big fat larvae of longhorn beetles that are super abundant in many severely burned forests. Not all, but many severely burned forests. So these longhorn beetles have sensory organs that can detect smoke and heat from fire miles away. So it tells them, ooh, there's going to be some good habitat for us to lay our eggs. They come flying in, and they lay their eggs on the freshly killed trees. And so that these are trees where they still have sapwood. It hasn't desiccated yet, um, but, the, uh, but they're you know, unable to pitch out the insects, right, because the trees are freshly dead. So these are really good habitat for the, grub, for the, for the, um, the, the longhorn beetles. So they lay their eggs on the bark. The eggs hatch in the larvae. They munch in there, and they're eating um, un under the bark, um, eating the sapwood. And they're there for one to three years. So this is a really long-term food source for the woodpeckers. So the woodpeckers come in, and they're, they're eating all these um, grubs, which are really large. You can see how big it is. So it's actually really good nutrition value for these woodpeckers. And it's not just black-backed woodpeckers, but other kinds too, hairy woodpeckers and so forth. The other reason they like really high severity fire areas is because there's fewer nest predators. In Like they love the biggest patches of high severity fire. Fewer nest predators in there also. These snags are really hard snags. And blackback woodpeckers have a physiological structure that enables them to excavate into harder snags than any other bird species in the world. They're you know, able to get into these really, really hard, fresh snags. That's where they make their nests, and they're really safe. And in fact, a couple of our nests, um, black bears tried to get into them. And it freaked me out, because I went out there, and I saw, I, from a distance, I could see that you know, the nest had been scratched out. And I was like, oh, no. But the nestlings were still safe inside there. So these make really good, safe nests. And they become primo, oh, that's not a very good view of it, but that's a, um, a mountain, I mean, a western bluebird, primo habitat for secondary cavity nesters. Um, so the blackback woodpeckers only use their nest for one year. And sometimes they excavate a lot of different nests during mating. Um, and so it actually creates a lot of different opportunities for secondary cavity nesters, like bluebirds and, and others. And so um, they really love this. And so not only do woodpeckers create habitat for themselves, but they're also important um, keystone species that make nest cavities for others that can't excavate themselves. OK, so not only are bird species benefiting from severe fire, but also other taxa as well. Uh, I know there's someone here named Aaron who's doing some work on bats in um, high severity fire areas here. Um, there's been a couple of cool studies published. Mallison and Baxter did their work in the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness of central Idaho. Um, and they found significantly more spiders, um, emerging aquatic insects, and bat echolocation calls, unburned, high burn, no, in the low, none in the low burn forest. So they were finding significantly more bats. Buchalski et al. did the same kind of thing in the McNally fire where I did my owl work found significantly more bat echolocation calls in high severity fire areas. And this makes sense because high severity fire can create really great basal hollows where bats can roost and it also has a super abundance of insects for them. This is probably the biggest picture of a deer mouse you ever want staring you in the face. But um, this is a deer mouse. I call this the king of, um, the, like the, basically it's the, an analog to the black back woodpecker for small mammals. It loves high severity fire. And there was, uh, Zwalak and Forsman did work in Montana, uh, yeah, Montana in the Douglas fir forest there. And they found that radio, uh, ear tagged, that they ear tagged a bunch of deer mice. And they found that when population densities were um, low, you only found deer mice. The vast majority of them were in the high severity burn areas. It was only when population densities were high did you start seeing deer mice in the surrounding unburned forest. So this is telling them that that's source habitat for these species. And many, many studies show that these these animals increase dramatically. They really love high severity fire, even in chaparral and lots of other habitats. Deer mice really like it. Uh, and they stated that there's a unique ecological value in severely burned forests, which needs to be weighed against the prevailing view that such natural disturbance events are catastrophic. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about Wanadal. Did some uh, work in um, National Forests of Utah, where they looked at, um, at that's you? 
You did this work? Awesome. Okay. So you, I was looking at, I was looking at, <laughs> I thought your name was Juan, but that's really cool. I thought this was a really cool study looking at aspirin regrowth and how bigger severity, big, bigger patches of high severity fire, you got better recruitment and, correct me if I'm wrong, better regeneration and better recruitment of aspirin. And partly this was because um, that there's reduced plant competition, but also partly because you have ungulates like elk that are drawn to burn areas and like to forage on the new aspen leaves. And the bigger the fire patch, you could swamp the browse capacity of the elk. I mean, of the, the elk, yeah, swamp the, broad, broad, the capacity of the elk to be able to browse on these leaves. And of course, if anybody likes to go looking for fire morels, this is the place to find them in a severe fire. I ate so many of them when I was working on the blackback woodpecker job that I'd never want to eat another morel again. They were everywhere. Okay, and Dick Hutto has said, again, I'm just kind of repeating ad nauseum, the biological uniqueness associated with severe fires could emerge only from a long evolutionary history between a severe fire environment and the organisms that have become relatively restricted in distribution to such fires. So again, the point here is that there are species like the spotted owl that can tolerate it, um, that will use it, take advantage of it. There's many that require severe fire for survival. And we're talking about the biggest, hottest kinds of fire, the ones that we're calling catastrophic. This is the only kind of fire that creates this unique habitat. Okay, so what we learn is that fire doesn't destroy habitat, it creates essential habitat for many species. Not all, but many species. And that you've had a long evolutionary history with this kind of fire, which is why these species have evolved to take advantage of it. So I think of high severity fires like the rain or the snow. It's just a thing that happens and it's variable through time, but it's just natural. Okay, so this isn't my area of expertise, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the, fire, the forestry research done. Um, because we say, wait, isn't there too much fire now? Because we've been suppressing fires, there's a buildup of fuels, there may be actually too much fire right now. So isn't that a concern? Um, well, what I would say is that in some cases this may be true in some types of habitat. I think it's generally agreed that maybe in the low elevation, pure ponderosa pine, there might be a bit too much now because of past fire suppression. But there is some interesting forestry research that's uh, contradicting or, or challenging this paradigm in most of the western forests in the U.S., including some of the ones that are xeric ponderosa pine forests. They're finding that high severity fire is actually a more important component historically than we previously thought, and that areas actually had more smaller trees than we previously thought. One study is by Dennis Odian and, and a number of other authors published in PLOS 1 um, that was in the western USA. They used published data sources um, that basically talked about historical fire severity and forest structure. And they also used forest inventory and analysis data from current to, to um, reconstruct fire severity in pre-history, uh, basically in the last few hundred years. And they, and they did it in all these different areas of the West. And what they found was that um, there was broad evidence of mixed severity fire regimes in ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forests of Western North America. Prior to settlement and fire exclusion, these forests historically exhibited much greater structural and successional diversity than implied by the low moderate severity model. And in fact, um, they said that for any forest that had, they, they recommended that for forests that had any component of severe fire in it, perhaps we shouldn't call those forests low severity. We shouldn't call that regime low severity. If it had high severity fire in it at all, it was structuring the forest there. It was structuring the faunal and floral community. So maybe it's mischaracterizing it to call it low severity. Oops. There's a lot of studies. Oops, I keep clicking. There's a, a lot of studies now showing that condition class. You guys know what that is, right? Um, does not indicate susceptibility to high severity fires. They're mostly in California. And I, this slide I first had had a whole bunch of studies listed, and then it kind of got to be a messy slide, so I took them out. But feel free to ask me. I can give you the citations afterwards. This means that fire uh, forested areas that have missed the most fire return intervals are not burning at higher severity than forest areas that have missed fewer fire severity intervals. They're, they're still burning primarily at low and moderate severity. And this takes us into the next thing that a lot of studies are showing that fire severity is not actually increasing. And this, is, this is an area of huge debate, and it's not my area of expertise, and you guys have a lot of experts here working on this, but there is a lot of data now that is showing that they're not necessarily, we're not having more incidents of high severity fire than we were in the past. I think that there seems to be pretty good evidence that some areas you get, you're getting more frequent fires and the fires are larger in size, which means we might have a bit more high severity than we would have had in the last several decades because a lot of these studies are really just looking at several decades, a few hundred years. 
Um, so, but what I say to that is that even if we do have bigger fires now and we have a little bit more high severity fire, there's a lot of species that love that kind of habitat. And because we've been pretty good at suppressing fires, um, especially small ones, we can't suppress the big ones, but we always suppress the small fires. And that has deprived these fire dependent species of their habitat. So perhaps if we have more fire like this, especially with a warming climate, we're actually, um, we're actually rectifying a deficit of fire for those species. <clears throat> okay, so those species have, you know, that I talked about, have evolved with fire for thousands of years over millennial time scale. So I wanted to talk about this really cool study, um, Pierce et al. in Nature, where they looked at um, charcoal and sediment data from alluvial fans in central Idaho um, and looking at this is xeric ponderosa pine forests. And this goes back 8,000 years. And so they can look at incidences of fire, both small and large fires. And here's what they found. <clears throat> this is time zero right now. This is going back in time, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years to 8,000. And this blue line is small fire events that they found from this charcoal and sediment record. This red line is severe fire events, big large events. And what they found over time is that in the cooler, wetter periods, there was fewer high severity fires. In warmer periods, there was more severe droughts, um, more high severity fires. And we're entering a warmer period, so we're just going to probably have to accept the fact that there's going to be more severe fires. But one uh, interesting thing here, this is the uh, medieval climactic anomaly. It was really warm from about 1,500 years ago to 650 years ago. And you have a huge spike in high severity fire events. This is us now. This is then. You see, there's orders of magnitude more severe fire back then before we ever had fire suppression or anything like that. And then this is the <clears throat> little ice age. So you can see there was a lot. And that actually, um, that was from like 615 years ago till about 100 years ago. A lot of small fire events. So I think we might, maybe we're entering a warmer phase again. Our fault, because we've created a, a warming climate. <clears throat> but regard, and we also start a lot of fires. So we have to deal with that. But there's, this is just interesting, because the point is that high severity fire is not unprecedented in Western forests. But wait, even if severe fire is natural, shouldn't we still thin or prescribe burn the forest to help protect our homes? And the answer is, we don't really need to. We don't need to thin or prescribe fire uh, out in backwoods areas in order to protect our homes. And this is Jack Cohen. He's a leading researcher. He's got lots of cool videos on his website. He's done a lot of publications. They got a fire lab in Missoula. And they've looked at lots and lots of data on how, why fire Fire, why structures burn in a fire. And what he found is that it's just what's on the structure and what's immediately around it that makes it susceptible to burning down. So <clears throat> you're talking about two things that can cause a, a house to burn. One of it is radiant heat, another is embers. A fire will not light a house from radiant heat when the fire is more than 100 feet away. So that's your defensible space, 100 feet around your house. Then there's also these fire brands that can come. And if you, you know, you've got to do things like clear out pine needles from your gutter, take away wood piles on your deck, and then your house itself needs to be firewise. You need to replace the flammable wood roof, replace that wooden deck, that kind of thing. If you do these things, your house stands an excellent chance of surviving a fire that's burning 100 feet away like this. It will still survive. We don't have to put firefighters at risk miles away in the backcountry fighting fires to protect our homes and communities. And then also, in my opinion, this false paradigm that we need to do all this thinning out in the forest and that severe fire is not natural is actually quite dangerous because it makes people think that if these thinning projects are done out there, then my home is going to be safe. We have done so much suppression of high severity fire that most of the acreage burn now is in big mega fires, huge fires like your Rodeo Chedesky and your Walla fire and in California, or the Rim fire and the McNally fire. These are huge mega fires that no matter how much thinning, no matter how much prescribed burning is done, these fires burn right through them. They didn't do a thing. These treatments didn't do anything to stop these big mega fires. It does, is able to stop fires in the small, small fire years when it's cooler, but in extreme fire weather, it can't stop it. And so this is evidence from the Rim Fire Lighterson at all. These guys are from the Forest Service. Um, new paper in Forest Ecology and Management stated extreme fire behavior can overwhelm well-designed fuel project treatments, which has been demonstrated in other extreme events. And they, did, they, had these, they looked at Yosemite's fire restored forest where they had multiple prescribed burns going through. The fire just tore right through them and burned at high severity through all of that. <clears throat> Same picture again. Um, so I wonder why there's such a disconnect between the, the research on the wildlife and everything and then the management. And this is, you know, 
the media still vilifies fire. This was, I, I get frustrated here because I did the looking at the spotted owls in the rim fire, and I, you know, this is what we read in the papers, right, uh, during the rim fire. Unprecedented destruction, destruction to plant life unparalleled, moonscape, destruction for the ages. This is what you see when you, when you have any these big fires that are burning, you get this kind of media frenzy and this anti-fire rhetoric. Um, so, but yet we know so much about how so many species require this fire, and I had given the Forest Service data, uh, you know, I analyzed their data for them and showed how many spotted owls were there. They knew it because they were doing the surveys. I had colleagues that went out and measured seedling regrowth in the rim fire, and it's prolific. It's a lot of seedlings regrowing. This was shown in the biscuit fire by Daniel Donato, another study published in Science showing lots of regeneration after these high severity fire areas. Um, and that post-fire logging then destroys that regeneration. But as we speak, the rim fire is being salvage logged. They ignored that data. And they're logging in occupied spotted owl sites now. And you know, they, they just flat out ignored it and wouldn't believe that spotted owls might be using these burned areas. So why? Why is that? This is actually an old, I thought this was funny, I saw it online, but this is not, you know, this is an old, old uh, thing, but this attitude is still very prevalent. Why is it that despite the fact we know that a lot of species love these fires and they're natural and everything, why do we still vilify it? And um, part of what I think it is is economics. This is actually me. This was a, these were logs from the fuel break, I mean the fire break, not a fuel break, the fire break they made while fighting the Red Star fire. They just cut huge swaths of these trees to try to stop the fire. Um, and so fire-related logging and firefighting especially are really big parts of the Forest Service budget. So I think there's a, um, there's a strong kind of conflict of interest there when they're planning their, their logging projects. You know, it's, a, it's the bread and butter for the Forest Service right now. Um, and in fact, during the 2013, uh, that was the year of the Rim Fire, the firefighting budget was $4.9 billion. And so they get these huge budgets for fighting fires, m millions more doing fuels reduction projects, and most of those are, are outside of, of, of the wildland urban interface. They're far away, so it's a lot of money that's at stake here. And it also, during the really big fire years, Congress tends to push legislation to bypass environmental review so those logs can get cut out quickly before the, uh, before the logs disintegrate. And this is from a post-fire salvage logging case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It has not escaped our notice that the Forest Service has a substantial financial interest in the harvesting of timber in the National Forest. We regret to say that the Forest Service appears to have been more interested in harvesting timber than in complying with our environmental laws. So there is a bit of a conflict of interest there. Second thing I was saying before uh, that might be a challenge to changing this paradigm about high severity fire is our own brains. Educated people, intelligent people, often don't want to change their minds about something that's a deeply held belief, even when faced with contradictory scientific information. And a lot of times, they'll reject the source. They'll reject the valid validity of the source. Uh, and this is especially true of important beliefs. You know, you can change your mind on something that's not that important, no problem. But if it's a really imp something important, there's inherent, inherent risk in changing your belief. Um, but there's just been really interesting research done on this that's, um, I, I Actually, I thought about this because I saw a speaker at Dartmouth talk about it. He's one of the main researchers doing some of this work. And so I thought this could be something that's happening with fire, too. Um, researchers discover threat to democracy our brains. I don't want to be right. Science of why we don't believe science. Um, you know, sometimes even head-on efforts to persuade people to change their minds can trigger a backfire effect where people hold on to their prevailing view even more tenaciously. And I think this could be something that's, that's part of the challenge of changing the paradigm and changing our worldview about severe fire. OK, so I hope I've drummed it in your head enough that severe fire is natural and it's important. There's many species that love it. <clears throat> so when you look at something like this, the rim fire, do you see a beauty marker scar? And so the kind of moral here is that there's uniqueness and ecological value in severe fire. We just have to sort of be trained to see it. People can look at the same thing and see two different things. You can see beauty or you can see something else. And if we look at it with an ecological perspective, we can maybe start seeing some beauty there. And finally, I just want to say that I really like to talk about this issue a lot because I feel like it's actually a positive message. It's a message of hope. So now when I hear about big fires burning and when I see the images on TV of huge rip-roaring infernos, I don't feel doom and gloom. I don't feel panic or fear. I'm not worried about the spotted owls out there, really. It's, instead, I think, oh, in a year, I'm going to grab some binoculars. I'm going to go out and check out what's out on that fire. And I think once as a society we can kind of embrace this worldview, we can redirect our 
limited tax dollars to doing things like making firewise homes and communities, and that's the thing that's going to effectively protect our homes and communities is right there. We don't have to needlessly log trees out in the backcountry in the name of trying to stop fire when we know we can't do that anyway in these big fire years. Um, and I just think you guys as you know, future foresters, future wildlife biologists might be able to help carry this message forward into the future. So I thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. And hopefully I've stimulated some discussion here about this issue. do you mean right immediately during a fire? Because with the Rim Fire, we found that was just one year after the fire. The fire occurred in the fall, and then just the next breeding season, starting in April, the owls were still there. Are, are they able to breed somewhere else? Oh, while the fire's going on? Um, they probably move away from the fire itself and then move back again. There's probably some maybe reshuffling. I, I don't know. That's a good question. If you had radioed birds, and set a fire or something like that to see what they did, then you can see where they moved during the fire itself. But, um, but we don't know that. But then generally they're often in their, their same spots afterwards. Or I think what happens is they shift around. You know, they're, they're, they maybe just kind of shift around a little bit based on the configuration of the high severity burn in that area. But they're still often using the general area. Uh-huh. This is where I wish I had my map up there that I showed you before, because there were some big, several hectares, areas of big patches in the McNally fire. Um, I took it off because it was, seemed like I didn't have enough time to show it. But there were some quite big patches of severe fire that the spotted owls were using, several um, hundred hectares in size. Several hundred hectares in size. That's pretty big um, for, you know, as far as that goes. And so we had the spotted owls in there using it. But they're, I forgot to mention that they're perch and pounce predators, for those of you that don't know. So they can perch on a dead tree and listen to what's rustling around down there. So they don't need to have, you know, it doesn't have to be, they, as long as they have a tree to perch on and the, as long as the prey are there, they can find it. But I think that's a good point because you're right about mixed severity. There's, there's high severity where, you know, a lot of times that's how they characterize Pacific Northwest, you know, wet forest areas, high severity because you have these giant areas. They only burn every several hundred years, but it's huge area, you know, lots of high severity. And then there's other areas where it's a little more mixed. but in, at least I don't know about down here, you guys are more the experts on that, but in California and the Sierra Nevada, you would have years where there were small, small pa smaller patches of severe fire, but then years, even historically, long time ago, there would be very big areas during dry years, warm years, there would be huge patches, several hundred thousand uh, hectares of high severity. So even though you characterize the Sierra Nevada, I characterize it as mixed severity, there were times when there was big patches of high severity, and that was natural. And that's what blackback woodpeckers really love, and they're found in the Sierra Nevada. But I think that's right. I think there was a component of maybe bigger patches of high severity in what's characterized as a mixed severity. Um, but that not every fire was going to have huge patches like that. Are they not growing back? Because eventually it'll grow back. It'll just take a long time. To cut it. Okay. That's a very awesome question. And maybe you can get to some of that because you're looking at longer after that. I mean, we had like several, like maybe five years after a fire. But we didn't, we weren't able to, we haven't done any work on much longer after fire. And I think that's an excellent question to see how that persists, you know, their occupancy. Time since fire. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing, you know, with the owls that live here along the country, I mean, we see that fire really did cause 
Yeah, and that's a good question because, as I mentioned, they're perch and pounce. So, but yeah, even in the severely burned areas, the trees will start to fall and there'll be less for them to, to perch on. But you did some, um, so you went back to the McNally fire. You were there 10 years later, right? Because that fire was in, actually, that fire was in 2000, more than 10 years because we did our work in 2006 and the fire burned in 2002. Yeah, so this is a long time after she, they found owls in the same three territories that we worked in. I think their numbers did kind of a bottleneck in the, this is what Rocky said, at some point after there were lots of huge fires in Sierra Nevada, maybe in like 1200, something like that. I'm not sure if that's ever published, but he kind of said that. But then they expanded again after that. But I, I do think this would be really cool to radio. You ha the only way you'll know what they're using is you have to use radio telemetry to know what they're using for foraging. So you can find their roosts and things like that, but if you want to know what they're using for foraging, you've got to slap a radio on them and track them around. But that would be cool to do that in you know, 15 or 20-year-old burn areas to see what they're doing. Fortunately, in California, so much of that was salvage logged. It's very frustrating. So you, don't, you have this conflation between salvage. That's what happened with Darren Clark. So he went out and, and did his work in Southern Oregon, but he had, it was conflated. You couldn't separate what was going on, what, what, what was caused by wildfire, and what was caused by the salvage logging. So hopefully there'll be some areas. Oh, so the El Dorado study area burned huge fire called the King Fire. And um, this is the study area. I point to Mike because he worked on that too, but this is where I worked with Rocky. Just had a big fire last year. And the Forest Service is planning on salvage logging it, but that would be so great to not do that because they have banded owls there going back from the 1980s. They have like yearly great, great data on where owls are, great vegetation data, maps, everything. This would be the most perfect, wonderful study on the effects of fire on spotted owls. So I dearly hope they decide not to salvage log that. There's, unfortunately, there's tons of private lands. It's checkerboarded because it was this sort of railroad checkerboard thing. So that all the private land, I'm sure, is already like clear-cut logged. And so you have these little like one-mile square areas that where the owls are, but hopefully they don't log on those areas and you can see some Cool, you have some cool research. But that's a really, really good question in longer time periods. I would love to know that. OK, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. Uh, we will be going over to room 34A to join graduate student discussion. Uh, regular folks in the audience are also welcome to join in that in small enough numbers. And then later on, about 6.30, we'll be going to Beaver Street Brewing for dinner. Let's uh, get another round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. If anybody wants, you know, has any more questions or wants any of the data, the, the papers, anything like that that I mentioned, please contact me. I'm happy to provide that.